Well, on Saturday we are going to celebrate um, our 10th anniversary. We have um, um, been a church now for, for 10 years. We were, um, I could say in a way, four years in, in embryo form in, in the Baptist church. But then we became an, an independent um, church church. Uh, 10 years ago in, in February, so it's, but it's still in our 10th year. And, um, and so we're going to have, um, you know, a special um, a Christmas dinner and fellowship and, and, and particular, with particular emphasis on the 10 years as a church. And there have been many changes um, in that 10 years. Of course, we, because we're an international church with workers and, and we've had so many Filipino au pairs and people coming and going um, that we have really been, uh, I think, the, the real send, sending church because not that we wanted to be to send them and not that they particularly wanted it to be sent but you know people come and people people go and and so there have been a lot of changes of um, of, of, of um, brothers and sisters coming and brothers and sisters going and that's probably the saddest uh, thing about our church that probably is, a, is the one the one thing that, I, that saddens me I, I, I just wish that I could gather every everyone together and that we could just spend the rest of our lives you know in 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 this church but you know we we do have the wonderful um you know we have the wonderful promise that one day we will all be um together we will all be together for, throughout all eternity and there will be this this gathering uh, from the four corners of, of of the world don't take me literally but you know from from everywhere in the world uh, and we will be gathered in heaven for uh, for eternity and our fellowship will be uh throughout all eternity and uh, we will have so much time uh, to uh you know to to, to just uh, get to know each other even even more but this time it will uh, our love and our fellowship will be absolutely um perfect um our worship um music has, has changed um our certainly our doctrinal um emphasis has changed dramatically and so there have been some big changes in the church over the, the last 10 years and i think in the next 10 years there will be changes as well and and uh, you know you will i probably won't be here but you will look back on on the next 10 years and and you will be able to look at the the things that were constant and the things that have have changed but for for me if i'm a, if i could choose one thing that hasn't changed a uh, one thing that i think locates us it really does it it it, it fixes us um i would say it is our our unity our love for one another and our fellowship um that i i've been pastoring um since i was in my late 20s i think i was 29 30 when i started um pastoring my first church and i pastored a number of churches uh in norway and and in in england where i come from um but there is no church that i could compare to to to, to this church uh i've pastored bigger churches um but i've never past at a church where I can look back on 10 years and say you have never given me a single problem uh, I think it is unique um, I think you are the the greatest church in in this world because I've never I've never been in a church that could come even close to your love and your forgiveness and your understanding uh, your big hearts the way that you overlook uh, the frailties and the weaknesses um, that um, that are there and obvious and, and as much as I try to hide them <laughs> that they're, they're there and 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 how you just 
are my joy and uh, and you know uh, the joy uh, I, I looked and I thought oh we have a new new goal tonight and and it was Ina and I thought well of course it's Ina but, but sideways on I couldn't quite see you know the the, the hair was hiding uh, the, the, uh, and, and you know the, the, the joy of seeing you all and uh, I went out in the passage to to get to, to get a drink um, from from the kitchen and and there just back from the beautiful Swiss Alps and there's there's Ellen and and, and Ren and, and and the joy uh, that 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 just gives me um, and uh, and 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 also not just joy but to have a new understanding and the next time I'm relating about my conversion experience and how I didn't know whether God existed or not and I mentioned the Swiss Alps I'll be able to say yeah we know they don't but we know because they've they've seen these magnificent Swiss Alps but it is that it, it is our joy and so I wanted to 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 speak because I won't be here next Sunday um, I'll be on a plane somewhere um, but I wanted to speak on something that I, I really felt um, is is TIRC something that really locates us and so I want to speak on fellowship so we have two readings Matthew 16 verses 13 to 20 Matthew 16 verses 13 to 20 Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? The Son of Man am. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And what a question that is. That's to every heart here. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. On this confession, on this understanding that, that I am the Christ, I will build my church. I will build my church on that understanding that I am the Messiah, I am the Christ. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. And we know that uh, the, the apostles did this great, um, this, this great work of, uh, of the New Testament. But I want also to look into the New Testament now and, and uh, this promise of I will build my church is beginning to, to be fulfilled. Acts 2, 36 to 47. Acts 2, 36 to 47. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call, including us. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptised. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Beautiful term, simplicity of heart. Praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. 
And this has continued till today. The God is adding to the church daily those who are being saved. And our prayer is that, um, that more and more will be saved in this church and throughout the world. Father, we thank you for this wonderful word from, from your heart that Luke, driven by the Holy Spirit, calls these wonderful words about the church, about the fellowship, about the love, about the power, about the evangelism and the spreading of the gospel and the adding to the numbers. And we thank you, Lord, that Matthew was driven by the Holy Spirit to reveal your perfect and absolute word to our hearts who live 2,000 years later. We thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that your word is also a word of healing. And, Lord, we, we pray for the young girl, Victoria, in Alta. And we pray, Lord, that, that you will touch her heart now, Lord, that you will touch her body, that, that Lord, these swollen tonsils, Lord, that, uh, that, that, Lord, you will just turn that situation around. We pray, Lord, that there will, there will be um, a, a lessening of the pain and discomfort, Lord. We pray that you will reduce the size of these tonsils, Lord. You pray, we pray, Lord, that uh, you will give both that child and her mother, and dear Layla, who has asked for prayer today, Lord, that, that you will bless them, give them a good night's sleep, Lord. And Lord, we, we know that we're gonna hear good news, Lord, about uh, little Victoria. We thank you, Lord, that you have a very very special place for the children and may that also be in our heart as a church we just thank you now in jesus precious name amen amen church fellowship the church coming together the church is a gift from god you can't just make the church it's a gift from god jesus said i will build my church Jesus died for the church. He loved the church. He uses the church in, uh, in, in, in picture form and says that we husbands are to love our wives with that sacrificial love as Christ had when he died for the church. So it is a gift from God to us. It is not our church. It is Christ's church. He died for the church. That is his right over the church he bought us the price has been say, paid we we are not our own we are we're bought with a price i have to remember that i have to remember that we're we're bought with a price it's a gift from god you know, we're, we're 20-something this evening. You, you couldn't get 20-something people in from the street and say, right, let's, let, let's have church. They, they, they just simply wouldn't know, they wouldn't have a clue. Because the Spirit of God that is in our hearts, that causes us such joy to meet together, is not in their hearts. Uh, they can meet together as in football clubs and, uh, and uh, they can meet together in skiing clubs. They can meet together uh, because they have an interest in dogs or they have an interest in, in, in horses. They can meet together, but they could never have church. They could never build a church. Which is why there's only one church and that's the true church. It's a church that preaches, preaches the gospel. It's a church that preaches sin and repentance. It's a church that believes that we can't just come in unconverted and start to act and live like the converted. We have to be converted. And then when we're converted, we are then transformed. As I, as I say, be, before I was saved, I spent some time in the church and uh, but you know I, I, I wasn't of the church until I was saved 
and then began that, that transformation of my heart and my life. People think that I was born with a Bible in my hand. I, I was totally ignorant of the Bible. And when I, as a 25-year-old, as I, I, I came to Christ, I didn't know a single verse in the Bible, and, and to my shame, I didn't know a single Christian song, hymn, chorus, or otherwise. No, it's a gift from God. And the church that Christ builds is built solely with believers who have repented of their sins and placed all their faith and trust in the finished work of Christ and his death on the cross. We can only enter into this church through the blood of Christ. We are a blood-bought church. We're bought with a price. We're not our own anymore. And that price is nothing less than that precious blood of Christ which he shed for the forgiveness of your sins, my sins, and in fellowship, our sins. It's his church, not our church. Christ died for the church. I spoke about praise and, and you know, included hymns and worship and contemporary contemporary hymns and some of them are, and contemporary songs and some of them are great. Uh, but it's, it's his worship, not our worship. That's why it is so important to know what the Bible says about how we are to worship God. And uh, we have a lot to thank the Old Testament for, but also we need to bring it into the, the New Testament because we are uh, New Testament Christians. We are New Testament believers. Although we believe in the Old Testament, but it is the New Testament that um, is our, it, you know, this, this, this is our um, uh, uh, command. This is our command book, the New Testament. But it's his worship. It's not our worship. You see, when we think it's our worship, we worship God, God wrongly. Nadab and Abihu, the, the sons of Aaron, are a fearful warning and the only reason that God doesn't strike some of us dead is that we are under a better covenant we're under a new covenant we're under the covenant that is so beautifully described in the book of Hebrews but God hasn't changed Jesus hasn't changed. The second person of the Trinity who created uh, the, the, the universe hasn't changed. God says he doesn't change. He cannot change. And so when we look at uh, Nadab and, and, and Abihu, Nadab and Abihu we, we, we mustn't say, oh, well, you know, they, they must have been pretty, uh, pretty poor. I bet they were drunk. I bet they did this. No, they, they offered strange fire. They offered wrong worship. They thought they could worship God their way. And it's a warning to, to us. It's not our worship. It's his worship. Otherwise we'll end up with the golden calf. Not everything that seems to be worship is worship. Not everything that seems to be praise is praise. They were worshipping around the golden calf and... and or a, you know, an understanding of the Old Testament is that they, they, they weren't a million miles away. They were trying to bring something in to their, their belief. They were adding something to their belief, the golden calf. They thought they were still worshipping Jehovah. But it is his worship. It's his church. And that it shouldn't fill us with terror but with joy because he has given us his Holy Spirit and if we're living clean lives if we understand the Bible if we really are um, men and women of the Bible not theologians but, but men and women who understand the Bible understand the basics of what TIRC teaches and, and, and believes and then we apply that to our hearts and we can worship God in spirit and in truth, without fear, without terror. God is a good God. 
God is a patient God. God is a, an understanding God. God is a God who, who, who passes over. As he passed over the Israelites on that night of terror and dread when the firstborn of the Egyptians were, were, were killed, he passes over. We are never going to be perfect in this church. There will never be a perfect pastor, a perfect preaching, perf perfect worship, per but we can please God because God always looks on the heart. He always looks on the heart. He always looks on the worship singer or the worship leader or, 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 or the mus musician who, who, who's never arrogant but always thinks, Lord, did my worship please you? I'm, I'm not quite sure. You know, I, I felt that I, I, I brought some of my own selfish thinking in and maybe maybe tonight lord i was wanting to to take a little bit too much of of, of, of the honor lord did i take honor away from you with my worship tonight preachers do must do exactly the same thing but god is good and god is gracious and god is merciful and if we have that heart my wife's away and and therefore um, I read two books this week, two books, um, a biography of Bethan Lloyd-Jones, um, the, the great Dr. Lloyd-Jones uh, wife, and, uh, and uh, a wonderful biography of uh, Robert Murray McShane written by um, Andrew Bonner, his, his, his friend. And, and um, I, I, I wish we could meet McShane now and didn't have to wait until, until heaven. But McShane, one of the greatest, greatest, greatest pastors who's ever lived and a man of immense humility and I'm, I'm reading his diary in, in his biography and, and you know and people have got saved and he and he goes home to his little home in, in Dundee and, and instead of rejoicing over those that say he said, he said Lord have I taken any glory away Lord am I, is there anything in my heart Lord that, 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 that wants to take some, some, some glory away and his whole life was like that and it I'm not saying we should overdo it. I'm not saying that we should, you know, be eternally looking at ourselves all the time. But if we have that heart, then our worship will be good. Our teaching will be good. Our preaching will be good because it will be pleasing to God. And we want to please God because he has given the church as a gift. True Christians are spiritual people and we feel in a way comparatively isolated in this world I hope you have a sense of isolation a little bit a little bit and, and not a sense of identity when we're with people who know nothing of the Lord Jesus Christ there will be after a while a a sense of alienation, a sense of I don't belong. You know, I, lo I love football, you know, but, but if I'm with non believing, non Christian, no football enthusiasts, after a while I, I'll think, oh, isn't there anything else? I, 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 just, I just can't identify. And so there should be some kind of comparative loneliness and isolation. And um, when we come together, it's the highlight of our week. D dear Sister Mona Lisa, I'll never forget, she came to a, a Friday Bible study and, and, and she said, there are the two highlights of my week, that a Friday Bible study and Sunday service. Uh, she understands fellowship. She understands that in spite of the good relationship she has with her work colleagues and the good relationship we have with the person that's, that, that serves us in, in, uh, in, in uh, the, you know, the, um, the, the, the fast food restaurant or, or, or something and, and, and we have good relationships with, with, with the, the people that we meet. We don't want to alienate, alienate ourselves. But when we come together you know, it, 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 this is the highlight. This is what I've been looking for. This is what I've, I, I, I've been missing. Fellowship, friendship, love, understanding, patience and kindness with my brothers and sisters in Christ. 
God has given us this wonderful compensation. Otherwise, we would be in incredibly lonely. Otherwise, we would be feel inc incredibly alienated as we, we simply cannot understand or identify with politics, with social uh, <laughs> ideas, with, with anything that doesn't come from the heart of God and isn't anointed by the Holy Spirit. But God has given this wonderful compensation, this fellowship we enjoy with each other. Uh, and it's that of, of loving brothers and sisters. The church should always be a blessing. No matter how many warnings the pastor might come with, no matter how many challenges preachers might, might come with, if they are not preaching the glory of the church, if they are not preaching the wonderful magnificence of Christian love and, and fellowship, then, uh, then you know, we, we are uh, in need of repentance because we're preaching hard. We're preaching judgmentalism, and it's never meant to be that. Woe the pastor who challenges and, and criticizes and, uh, and, and, and comes with negativity if it isn't to bring joy and love and growth to the people. Our fellowship is very special because we have essential things in common. We have the, the agape love of God that's been shed abroad in our hearts. The experience of saving grace altogether. The, the feeling of our enmity with the world, that we don't belong to the world. The expectation of the coming glory. That as wonderful as this is, it gets better. It gets better. And we think, yeah, but wow, it's good now, but it will get better. The common hunger and thirst for God. I want more. And, and how attractive, and, 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 but also challenging when we meet brothers and sisters. Especially the ones who are new converts. <laughs> and... And, and we, we just think, oh, this is so wonderful. Their testimony, their first prayer. You know, I think the fir first prayer of a convert, they're kind of thinking, oh dear, I can never pray like pastor. And pastor's sitting there thinking, I can never pray like him. I can never pray like her. I'm not a new convert anymore. I'm not a new believer in Christ. I don't have that, 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 that newness and, and that, that, that everything was exciting. Everything was new. Everything was... And, 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 and it's wonderful because new converts should, should challenge us more than anyone in the world. I, I don't want to give secrets away and betray the confidence of, of Shur and Ramos, but I will. Uh, you know, we, we have gone to elders' meetings and we've mentioned new converts. Uh, some of you are here tonight and I'm not going to mention your name. And we've, and, and we've said, oh, are we like that? Do we have that joy? Do we have that freshness? Do, what, do, do we have that? I think elders should do that. I think we should never become proud and think that, uh, well, we're up there and, and, and we have a wonderful, wonderful congregation down there. Now, sometimes we feel that you are up there and we wonder where we are. It's, it's a wonder. It's, it, it's a miracle. A hunger and a thirst for God and a grateful love for Christ. An experience of the beauty of holiness. A love for Holy Scripture. I'm not saying we feel like this all the time. We don't. If you'd have spoken to me an hour ago, um, I wouldn't have been thinking this or, or saying it. I'm worried about my sermon and worried about this and, and I just don't seem to have it all together. And, and, and No, we're not like it all the time. We have really, really bad days sometimes. But we don't have bad lives. We might have a bad week, but we don't have bad lives. That's another common 
thing that we have together. Pastor has bad days. Pastor has bad weeks. Pastor has bad nights. We have this in common. Because we have an enemy that wants to destroy and kill and steal. and we, know we, we have our own flesh to deal with. We have our own sin to deal with. Our own temptations to deal with. But we are together in fellowship. All this, all this sets us apart from the world. So we do not seek friendship with the world. Or do we? No. Basic to the New Testament idea of fellowship is this glorious truth of having all things common. Now, in the book of Acts, they literally had all things common, and the rich sold what they had, and, and that meant that the poor uh, you know, were looked after. Um, and and um, you know, we, we have rich and poor in the, in the, the Old Testament. But this was not prosperity gospel. The rich gave to the poor. They were expected to give to the poor. And they were expected to give until it hurt. It didn't hurt, but you know what I mean. It doesn't hurt to give. You, you love to do it. The Greek word koinonia, it means having things together. It means having things together. Communion, fellowship, that's what koinonia means. Just knowing the meaning of this word will never give it to us. Just knowing, oh, I know what koinonia means. Wow. Mm, well, that, uh, really, that really raises me above a lot of Christians. Koinonia, it means having things together. It means communion. It, it means fellowship. You didn't know that. You know. No, just knowing the word isn't going to help. It's knowing it in our hearts. Knowing the meaning of this word in our hearts, the real meaning of New Testament fellowship, can only be known by us if we are spiritual and joyful Christians. Our duty as believers is to promote true fellowship by every possible means open to us in this life. It's our duty and privilege to improve the quality of our fellowship as far as this is possible. As I said, Christians uh, can feel lonely and, and isolated. We're often scattered far from each other and often kept very busy at our secular jobs, especially today. Much of society now is no longer eight to four or nine to five. I had a very, very, um, you know, a, a fairly, well, a tiny, important job. No, I worked as a buyer, and I worked for some of uh, the biggest companies in, in the UK. And I had a lot of people working for me. And, you know, uh, you know I, I had a spend of, of around nine, ten million pounds a year. And this is back in the 19, uh, early 1970s. It was a lot of money. But it was nine to five. And only once, in all my years as a buyer, did I receive a phone call in the evening about nine o'clock at night. And um, I was working for Spillers Foods, it's a major food group, um, bakery division. And we had a major problem in Newcastle, Couldn't, that doesn't get much further, London to Newcastle. I was on the first train the, the next day um, and on my way to, to Newcastle. But, but today it, it, it's changed. And so this feeling of pressure and stress and isolation, um, uh, you know, the, 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 of not having your own private life and space, is, is far more compromised today than it was in my day. Things were so much simpler. No mo mobile phones. Out of the house, no one could get in touch with you. No, 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 I enjoy you getting in touch with me, don't, don't get me wrong. But um, there is a stress today, and it can lead to isolation, and it can, it can lead to a, a feeling that um, it's not good. It, it harms fellowship. We're often scattered. Often we're in an environment very hostile to our Lord and Saviour. Well, that's always been, you know, uh, you know some of the... Um, companies I worked for uh, were so image 
um, conscious um, that um, it was um, a very, very difficult, very hostile environment. <coughs> Consequently, we're often spiritually hungry by the time we meet each other. We've been, we've been looking forward to this. We've been in hostile environments. And it's when we meet one another that we receive love and comfort and encouragement. And in addition, we build each other up in our most holy faith. There is so much false teaching and worship in Christian churches today that we need our own dear fellowship to comfort and encourage us. Now, I'm not saying that our theology and our doctrine uh, is, is absolutely word perfect according to, uh, to, to God's word. But I don't think there's a lot of false teaching in this church. I don't think there's any blasphemous teaching in this church. God is sovereign. Christ is our Lord and our Saviour. And we are sinful wretches who have been wonderfully saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we always come with this attitude of, oh, I'm saved, I'm a child of God, and I'm a sinful wretch. And we try and balance that all the time. And fellowship helps us to do that. So that when our heads are down, there'll be brothers and sisters to lift it up. But if I begin, and if we begin to be a little bit too head up, then uh, you know, we, we, we will have a good message or, or a good study or a good introduction on a Sunday that will, will re remind us where our heads should be. Not down in shame, but not up in pride and arrogance, but straight ahead looking for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we see the false teaching, when we see the worldliness of the modern church and the unfaithfulness of church leaders, what a wonderful experience it is to meet in loving fellowship with like-minded Christians in a loving church fellowship. This loving, forgiving of fellowship is all the more essential because each one of us is sinful, even though wonderfully and truly saved. We vary in personality. We vary in education. We vary in interests. It took a long time for me uh, to uh, get uh, Puneeth and Karina so that I could talk about cricket. We had different interests. We vary in sanctification. We are justified, every single one of us. And the moment that we are saved, we are justified. Not partly, not 99%, but 100%. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, so that in him we are are the righteousness of God and you are 100% justified but we are not 100% sanctified and so some of us will maybe be more sanctified than others at least we think we are um, but um, but sanctification is a process uh, and you, know, you, you may have come to Christ about the same time as a brother or sister in the church and you have leapt ahead in two years and they haven't. They're, yeah, they're sanctified, they're growing, but not at the same level as you are. Uh, be, be careful, because it only needs one touch from God, and uh, you will find their sanctification improving a thousand percent, and you will find yourself trying to catch up. It just needs one touch from God. And a believer who is struggling with sin and struggling with sanctification and isn't really growing. That, that Christian only, only has to have one glimpse of God, one glimpse of heaven, one glimpse of who the Saviour really is, one glimpse of the sovereignty of God, and they will leap forward in sanctification. But we're not all um, at the same level of sanctification. We vary in our gifts. 
We vary in our many different cultures, as I will find out next week when I take a wedding in the Philippines. And uh, uh, that is um, outside my comfort zone. Um, and uh, that will be very, uh, very interesting um, situation. But we vary. That's the wonderful thing. That, 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 you know, there, there isn't the, uh, you know, there isn't the, um, the, the, the perfect uh, Christian. You know, we, we can't say, right, this is what we, you all have to be like. Because we, we vary. Although we love the evangelical faith, we have differences in opinion over certain doctrinal issues. And we have different interpretations over certain scriptures. I was listening to uh, uh, dear Jeff Thomas, and uh, he was being interviewed, um, and, and he's a Baptist, now he's a Reformed Baptist, and he went to Westminster Theological Seminary in, in, in London, and that is pre Presbyterian, and, and the difference is that, uh, that uh, Baptists and Reformed Baptists believe in, uh, in only baptising uh, adults, we, or, or, or at least those that come to Christ maybe from 13, 14 years upwards, that's, you know, um, and, and we, we, we believe that uh, we baptise by, normally by, by full immersion, and we have our very strong Baptist views. Presbyterians uh, are wonderful Christians, reformed, uh, um, strict, believing in the five points of Calvinism, the, the five solas, uh, alike with us in everything, but they baptise infants. And, uh, and, and, you know, they do that with a good heart and a good conscience. And, and Jeff Thomas was saying that he was at a, he was at a, a conference, and after the conference uh, uh, he was speaking with a Presbyterian. And uh, he said, um, and, uh, I think it was actually a question and answer uh, series, and, and he looked across and he said um, to, to the man, um, he said, David, he said, um, you're a Presbyterian and you have three boys, you have three children, and uh, you baptise them all after a few days, you know, they were a few days old. He said, I, I'm a Reformed Baptist, I didn't baptise my children. I waited until they took that, uh, you know, that the, the, they were saved by, by grace, that the, their understanding was op open, and I didn't baptise them until they were new covenant children. He said, what advantage do your three children, who you baptised after a few days, have over my three children, who I didn't baptise until they were nearing adulthood? And this dear, godly Presbyterian man who believes in infant baptism with all his heart said, none whatsoever. And Jeff said, what a gracious man. And that's how we should be today. There are reformed believers, evangelicals, I prefer to call us. There are evangelicals who differ on baptism, differ, differ on spiritual gifts, differ on this, differ on, on, on that. But we must not isolate ourselves anymore. We are already far too isolated. We must embrace them as brothers and sisters in the Lord and still, like dear Jeff Thomas, hold what I believe in believers' baptism by full immersion after coming to faith. We are different. Our loves, our love needs to be genuine. Our spirits need to be sensitive to others. Our hearts large and humble and determined to maintain a spirit of unity as far as it is as, as possible. As long as it doesn't compromise our own beliefs. We, light cannot have fellowship with darkness. But we must be careful. We must be careful who we call darkness. We need to be very forgiving. What a wonderful testimony it would be were we to hear those wonderful words of encouragement for all true believers, whatever their denomination, whatever their, their, their little differences, see how they love one another. See how they love one another. The Christian is always growing and will never reach perfection until we enter into the glory graciously prepared for us.
Before we come together, it will enhance our fellowship if we prepare our hearts every week, every Friday, every Sunday. So we prepare our hearts not to boast, not so that uh, I can uh, you know, prepare so I come with the cleverest uh, sermon I, I could, um, I could um, uh, come up with, and that wouldn't be very clever. Um, uh, you know, but but the, the, we, we prepare our hearts to bless our brothers and sisters, that we have something to share other than the latest news and the latest football results. And if we were in England, thankfully we're not, you know, the latest Brexit um, and, and negotiations. Oh, I praise the Lord for the call of God to Norway. Uh, but, uh, you know, so that we, we're prepared. We come with something that has blessed us, which we believe will be a blessing to others. This can be the fruit of our own study or something we have heard or, or read in the Bible or, or Christian book or, or just something we've experienced this week. And we come on, we bless one another. Our testimony of God's dealings with us are a great blessing to others in the church. Our fellowship is a great place where the religion of the heart is declared. Sure, and I were speaking before the service, and we, we were both, uh, you know, we, we get together, we speak about um, uh, Lloyd, Lloyd Jones, and, and uh, we, were, we were speaking uh, about uh, his great belief in the religion of the heart. You see, Lloyd Jones always believed that if we just have doctrine, if we just have theology, if we just have knowledge, and there's no heart application, there's no transformation, there's no beauty, there's, there's no joy, there's, there's nothing to, to bless and share with others. He said, it is useless. And in fact, he said, it's more than useless. It is sinful. So what we have learned in secret the answers to prayer, our hunger and thirst for more of God's love and holiness, the hand of God in guidance. These are matters on which our fellowship can truly feed. Sometimes I, I mention something maybe about my own calling and, and, and there's a visitor here and, uh, and that visitor has that calling of God over their life and without me realising it, I've, you know, I've, I've blessed that person. Because I know what it is to have the call. I know what it is to live with the call. I know what it is to have to be patient and wait 10 years for the call to be worked out. And for me to get on that ship, that boat, and, and come to Norway. So sometimes we, we bless one another with our testimony, with the dealings of God with us. These are matters on which our fellowship can truly feed. And when we meet together, let us seek to have this, this, this felt sense of Christ's presence with us. It's a wonderful experience to meet with other Christians and realise that we have the divine presence with us. I remember, you know, as a new convert visiting my pastor, and, and he had this divine presence. You know, the, there was something of Christ about him. And I would go there and he had a really bad heart. Uh, praise God, he'd lived to be 84, but even in his late 50s, he had a very, very serious heart attack, had a bad heart. And, and his dear wife, dear, dear uh, Eileen Howe, she would say, now, now Bert, you behave yourself. Let Robin do the talking. Let Robin do the talking. He's here um, and, and, and you know, he, he has also uh, something to share. Um, but, but when my pastor began to get going about Ephesians and, 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 and the church and, and, and the, this wonderful epistle to the church, his heart would just sing and, 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 and just, just rise and, and, and he would completely forget everything his wife had told him. But I would just be drinking it in because not it wasn't just words. It was the heart of a man who'd been touched and humbled and, 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 and blessed by God. In a way, I miss those days. It sometimes happens that the Lord gives us an anointing and a great sense of his presence to his people in our gatherings when we're gathered together. When we come
coming for fellowship, sometimes our hearts burn within us. I, I used to go to, um, to the chapel, Bellis Park Chapel, um, Evangelical Free Church in, in England. And th that didn't happen every time. It didn't happen every month, but maybe, maybe every few months. Something that was spoken, something that was, was said would, would get my heart to burn within me. And in our wider fellowship, we are to be inclusive of all. And this is one of the most difficult ones. We'll naturally feel closer to some brothers and sisters simply because of similar interests, doctrinal closeness, but we are not to be narrow and mean and leave some people out of our inner circle. Otherwise, it cannot be said, see how they love one another. It would be, see how they love some. But we will find brothers and sisters where we will feel a special fellowship, a special bond. There's nothing wrong in that. There are sometimes we will just feel that we have that, that closeness to a brother or a sister in Christ. But we are to have a wide fellowship, a big hearts. I speak to myself as much as I speak to anyone. It's a thing much to be desired that God would give us such friendships. It's such a thing to be desired that God would, would place us in a fellowship with such friendship amongst brothers and sisters who fear his name and love his presence who are in awe because he is the sovereign God, but who come boldly because he is the Christ who died on the cross to forgive us our sins. And God wants us as close as he can to his heart, not in fear, at a distance. And the purpose of God for our lives and our fellowship is that we should be mature, over the years so that when we are ready to meet with the Lord Jesus Christ we're not full of regret and looking back but we are mature Christians who are now as close to being Christ like as it is in this life because in heaven and throughout eternity as I've said it before because it's so wonderful God has created us to be throughout eternity as close as it is possible to be as a human being as close to God to being like God as it is possible to be without ever being God that's his purpose that's what we will be doing throughout eternity we will be as like God as it is possible for any human created being to be without being God I'll settle for that I'll settle for that Satan didn't settle for that he wanted to be God. I think the glory will be that we will be overwhelmed with his grace and his mercy and his love to us. They are a source of great strength to believers as we go on in our fellowship and in our friendship. And our fellowship and our church will go a long way to compensating for the often loneliness of the believer at work, education, amongst unsaved families and unsaved friends very often. But the fellowship of God's people in the church will go a long way to compensate for that loneliness. The pilgrim on his narrow way. God is a wonderful God. I've been looking... Um, at three different um, men of God, uh, well, two, two men of God and one very, very, very young woman of God. Two of them have major biographies. The lady has just, you know, very, very small biography. Robert Murray McShane, as I've said, was the 
pastor in Dundee, he died at the age of 29 of tuberculosis consumption, as they called it then. Going over to the other side of the Atlantic, um, David Brainard worked amongst the Indians. Um, his, I won't even try and even speak about his biography. It's worth a good read. He died at the age of, I think it was before his 29th birthday. Both these men are regarded today as two of the greatest Christians that have ever lived. Jonathan Edwards wrote David Brainard's biography. It's the only um, book of Jonathan Edwards never to go out of print. And it's the most widely read book that Jonathan Edwards ever wrote. It is not theology, it is the life of David Brainard, who just gave his heart, gave his life, died in absolute agony. Um, uh, his, his death is, is graphically portrayed in, 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 um, in Jonathan Edwards' biography. But to the very end, in absolute agony, and I won't describe the symptoms, um, you know, but they are harrowing to even watch. But he died in absolute joy of meeting his saviour. But we're talking about fellowship. When Brainard became ill and was dying, Jonathan Edwards had children. And his second youngest uh, daughter was um, Jerushua, that was her name, Jerushua Edwards. And she nursed Jonathan Edwards. And there developed a wonderful friendship she nursed him through his illness until the day he died. She never left him his side, first at Brainard's house, and then when Brainard was too ill, he came and he spent his last weeks at Edward's place. She never left his side. One thing that Jonathan Edwards has to say is to hear David Brainard in prayer was the most humbling the most wonderful, the most glorious experience as Brainard poured out his life and his soul to his saviour. Brainard died at the age of 29. A lot of biographers, just, it, wouldn't it be a lovely romance? They want, they want to have this romance between David Brainard and Joshua Edwards, um, but it doesn't seem it was, it could have been, but it doesn't seem that it, it had reached that at the time. They were a brother and a sister in Christ who loved this fellowship of prayer, of Bible reading, and, and she looked after him until the day he died. For me, it is fellowship at its greatest because just about four months later, Joshua Edwards died of sickness at the age of 17. But for me, these are glorious truths of what fellowship is really like. Whether it is the church fellowship of believers when we're meeting, whether we're 500 or, or whether we're 50 or whether we are 20, or whether it is a, 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 a two Christians like, like uh, Brainard and, 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 and Joshua uh, Edwards are coming together and just having this wonderful fellowship together. She nursed him through his illness. He died. She died very shortly after. But these are not deaths of, of agony and, and, and harrowing uh, uh, what if. These are deaths that were glorious. These are deaths where the people dying are still read hundreds of years later. These are voices from the past that we can listen to, read, and be encouraged on our own walk with God. Because, because if, if men and women can die at the age of 29 and the age of 17 with such joy, with such longing for the Saviour, then it would be absolutely terrible and selfish for me if I, approaching the age of 74, should feel sorry for myself. 
If they can die gloriously at 29 and 17, then we can die gloriously at 74 and 80 and 90. Because of our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ and our wonderful fellowship one with another. So let us enter this next 10 years with the, the, with, with the goal of encouraging one another. And if we see someone come into our service, and just one of you, you, you realise that maybe that person, maybe that man, maybe that lady is, is unconverted, then let us love them and pray for them and bless them and include them, but never give them any peace until they know the love of the Saviour. And may, may in the next 10 years, we, we, we see this church winning far, far, far men and women for Christ. So let that be at least two of our goals for the next 10 years. Encourage one another, love one another, and win the lost. So that everyone that enters this church that we think isn't saved, we don't think, oh, I don't want to offend them. We look at their eternal destiny and we say, I'm never going to give them peace. I won't frighten them away, but I'm going to pray for them every day. I'm going to seek every way to win them for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we just thank you for the fellowship of believers, Lord, that we find in the New Testament, that we find in the Bible, that we find throughout history. But we thank you, Lord, especially today for our church and for this church for the way that you have graciously led us and guided us, how you have added to our number, how you have brought sinners to repentance, even here. And we just thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done. You did say that you would build your church. And we still believe that for today, Lord. And we, we pray and we believe that in the next 10 years, Lord, we will truly see the wonderful truth being fulfilled that you will build your church oh Lord build your church by bringing unconverted men and women in sending us out and may we win the lost Lord and be part of the great commission we ask in Jesus precious name